So tonight, it really is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce our um, guest of honor, who is not only a celebrity, but also a patient with Chiari and Syringomyelia. Roseanne Cash, many of you may know her because she's had 11 number one hits. She's a Grammy award-winning artist, singer, songwriter. She started performing in high school, and this year she is going to be a resident at Carnegie Hall for the 2015-16 season. Perhaps you don't know that she's published children's books. She's a fabulous author. She's a New York Times columnist. And she's written an, her intimate story in a book called Composed. Every year at this gala, we either ask a patient or uh, perhaps the parent of a child to come up and tell their story with the public so that physicians, um, scientists, and all of us really begin to understand the tremendous hurdles that uh, medically, financially, personally, that we have to overcome. Roseanne is here because she shares a common thread with everyone in this room. Chiari, syringomyelia, related disorders. We're all here because of them. So there is a silver lining. And I think that um, everyone feels that a celebrity spokesperson would raise awareness and truly help our cause. And we could raise more funds and perhaps fund more education and more research. But we all know that I think it's especially hard for someone who's in the spotlight and achieved celebrity status to get up and share their intimate story. So I personally am very grateful, and I know we're all grateful here, that Roseanne is here to tell her story and lend her voice to help the over three million families find support through education and research programs to improve their quality of life. And on behalf of the Chiari and Syringa Mayelia Foundation, I'd like to welcome Roseanne Cash to the CSF family. Please come and accept your award. I think my neurosurgeon should actually receive this award, <laughs> not me, but thank you. I am honored and delighted. Do you want to sit down? You don't want to stand up here for this whole time. <laughs> I would feel so bad for you. Um, it's, I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you, Dorothy, so much. I am, as some of us like to call ourselves, a zipper head. You never heard that before? It's uh, because of the 20 staples up the back of your head after surgery. So um, I'm a zipper head. And I'd like to give a shout out to the other zipper heads and acknowledge that our stories may be very similar. Um, I'm happy to get a chance to tell my story as I've really only told a very few people much more than just the basics. Um, you seem like a demographic I could bond with. <laughs> um, I've avoided Chiari groups, chat rooms, fundraisers, every other community identifying themselves with Chiari, to be perfectly honest, because um, I didn't want to be the public face of a disease, which is what I was asked to do, and I didn't want pity more than anything else. I wanted my life back. I wanted to write and create music, and I wanted to enjoy my families. And 
in some ways, I know that was sort of selfish, uh, as I could have used my public persona to bring attention to a condition that could use wider acknowledgement and research. I just couldn't find it in myself to do that. I mean, I'm a performer, but in some ways I'm shy, <laughs> as many performers are. I have to say, though, a couple of years after surgery, I was the cover girl on that sexy publication, Neurology Now. <laughs> <laughs> but that has a very limited audience. <laughs> but after the surgery, I wanted to move on. And I've done that to a great degree. And so now I feel more comfortable talking about it with some distance and from the vantage point of recovery. And also, this is the first organization that I found that is sensible, serious, and focuses on recovery rather than carrying the disease as a victim and a banner. So my story, Dor Dorothy says, this is your moment to tell your story. I had headaches for most of my life. And you can become accustomed to just about anything, and I did become accustomed to them. But starting in 1996, the headaches got worse. And I started noticing other symptoms that much later I found out were due to a compromised and scarred brainstem and a syringomyelia that was somewhat narrow but that extended down almost the entire length of my spine, and which still does. So for the first time in 96, I saw a neurologist. She said I had cluster headaches. In 1999, after the birth of my son, my symptoms were no longer inter intermittent, but became constant. So I changed neurologist, and the new neurologist said I was having a combination of atypical migraines, as well as cluster headaches, occasional thunderclap headaches, meaning they were like getting hit in the back of the head with a brick, complicated by perimenopause and stress. I find a lot of women get told that. It's your hormones. <laughs> uh, no medications worked for me, so I became a spa junkie. I a massage, acupuncture, any manner of alternative therapy that would give me relief for a day or two or three, and that's how I lived. I performed, I made records, I wrote books, I raised children. I hid from my husband just how often I went to the spa, and I hid from him how bad the pain was. I didn't want to kill our romance by being perceived as someone who was in chronic pain. And I believe that with all my heart that my devotion to my family and my creative work kept me upright, active, and free from self-pity. Music alone is one of the greatest healing forces in the universe. And as a singer, just moving the sound of my own voice through my head and vibrating those cranial plates from the inside out was redemptive. And I'm sure the other singers here know what I mean. I was also devoted to yoga. And in about 2001 or two, a yoga teacher he moved my neck to help me get into a pose, and then he stepped back really startled, and he said, I don't know what's going on with your neck, but you don't do any poses that are inverted, like headstands or shoulder stands. He was the first person who recognized there was something really wrong with me. So I was a big believer in alternative therapies, and though I do still think that some can be very helpful, I no longer rely on them solely. Looking back, it was shocking how many of those practitioners, in essence, blamed me for the pain and the limitations. They said I was too stressed, I had some kind of spiritual deficit, I hadn't gotten over my childhood, I was wearing too many dark colors. <laughs> those are all actual things that these people said to me. Um, so at one point, in about 2006, I diagnosed myself by going on the internet, and I asked the neurologist to see if I had Chiari malformation. So she ordered the MRI just to, you know, placate me, 
And when she gave me the results, she said, you have a low riding cerebellum and that just causes more headaches. You don't have Chiari. But in late 2006, I had to give up yoga, which I was doing four to five times a week and which I really, really loved. I was in so much pain, I couldn't even do that anymore. And it wasn't just my head and my spine. It had spread to other areas. I was having symptoms related to a compromised brain stem at this point, swallowing, breathing, and I was really frightened. So in the summer of 2007, I just gave up. I broke down. I said to my husband, John, I have to find out what's wrong with me. So I changed neurologists again, and I sought the help of Dr. Norman Latov at Cornell. And after the usual tests and the MRIs, in about two weeks, he said, you have Chiari malformation and a syringomyelia, and you need surgery. And my first reaction was intense relief. But I called John as I was leaving Dr. Latov's office and I said, how do you feel about brain surgery? He was not quite as relieved as, as <laughs> I was at that point. But do you know, I never said, why me? I never said that. I never thought, why me? I thought, well, why not me? You know, I have we're in the body, we're subject to the frailties of the body, everyone, I'm not exempt from that. I have great health ins insurance. Um, I can afford to take time off work. I have a really supportive family and friends, including my friend Danny Kahn, who's with me tonight. Why not me? I can get better. So, I sought the advice of five uh, prominent neurologists and neurosurgeons who all confirmed Dr. Latov's opinion, all said I needed surgery, and one surgeon, uh, neurologist at Johns Hopkins, um, no, at Madison, Wisconsin, said, uh, a stoic nature and a high tolerance for pain is a very bad combination. He pointed to this thread-like white line on my MRI going into my head and he said, you see that little trickle of fluid? That's what's keeping you alive. And I went, when do we book the surgery? <laughs> so Dr. Guy McCann, he's this very kind neurologist at Johns Hopkins said, look, I don't want to uh, indulge in nepotism, but my son, Guy McCon II at Columbia University Medical Center is a fantastic neurosurgeon. So I liked the idea of seeing someone who was in the same business as his dad. I have some experience with that. <laughs> and when we met, when I met Guy, I felt this um, an immediate connection to him and I said, if anyone's going to open my skull, I want it to be you. So a couple of weeks before the surgery, Guy said to me, um, you have to psychologically prepare yourself for this. And I didn't know what he was talking about. You know, I, I knew it would be tough, it's a surgery, but I knew my own resilience, and I'm a tough person. And I had concerts booked for four months after the surgery, and I figured I'd be fine, I'm gonna make these. My main fear was that messing around with my brain would make me lose my ability to feel the beauty of music. So I asked Dr. McCann about any data on that. And he said, that's a question for a mystic, not a surgeon. So I wrote a letter to Oliver Sacks. <laughs> and I had recently met him at a party and I asked Dr. Sacks if he thought that surgery for a Chiari malformation would affect my ability to create or enjoy music. He wrote back this typewritten, ink-corrected letter that looks like a holy relic, which I, of course, saved. And it said, in essence, your problem is your cerebellum, and my expertise is the cortex, so I can't really answer you, but I do know how important it is to you. And just that <laughs> made me feel a lot better. So I had decompression surgery and a laminectomy on November 27th, 2007, the eighth anniversary of my surgery is this coming Friday. 
The morning of the surgery, Dr. McCann came into the prep room with this posse of adorable residents and said, how did you sleep? I said, no. The pertinent question is, how did you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> then the nurse doing my intake asked, um, what are you having done today? And of course she knew what I was having done, but there, you know, there must have been some box she had to check saying patient fully understands nature of procedure. And so I said, liposuction. <laughs> and she's, this poor woman went white. <laughs> and my husband muttered, he said, stop torturing people. So then the anesthesiologist came in and I asked if I could please walk into the OR rather than be wheeled in. I said, I just feel so much better if you just let me walk in on my own steam. And he said, that's fine with me. So as we walked through the double doors, he leaned over and he whispered, I've done this twice before and it turned out well both times. <laughs> So I walked into the OR laughing my head off, which was a great way to go into a six-hour surgery. <laughs> so Dr. McCann told me afterward that my Chiari was, quote, impressive, 15 millimeters. I know. And look at me now. So there was um, significant scarring on the dura around the brainstem, which he cleaned up. And in the post-surgical report, halfway down the page, it says, almost delightfully, it says, of note, the patient's bone was very thick and required excessive drilling. In layman's terms, he told John that I had the hardest head he had ever drilled into. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had broken a few drill bits getting into my skull. My husband predictably responded, I could have told you that. <laughs> Guy said that, during the, that the computers that were hooked up to my brain during surgery showed improvement in the impulses to my left ear once everything was freed up. And he said, I thought it was an artifact, but damn, it was real. Was it ever? That first year after surgery was really tough. I had to cancel those concerts in the spring. I spent a lot of time lying on the couch thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. What was important? As my friend said to me, you have more to say and less time to say it. What are you going to do? I didn't want to waste any time. You come face to face with your own mortality. It's a clarifying moment. So I couldn't listen to music with lyrics for many, many months. It, was, it seemed too confusing and distracting, and I was really worried. I got out my piano books from elementary school, and I started reteaching myself all those old simple pieces that I had learned as an eight and nine-year-old from the nuns. And music started coming back to me. Or I started coming back to it slowly. But the real enjoyment of music came back in a flood about a year after surgery. I was so ecstatic and so relieved. Now that's anecdotal, of course, but it's perhaps it's significant. And um, my friend Dan Levitin, who's a neuroscientist and a musicologist, he keeps threatening to do a peer-reviewed study about this, you know, this music thing that came back. And maybe I love music more now just because it was harder to experience through this veil of chronic pain. But maybe those improved neural impulses to my ear that Guy McCann saw, maybe they do mean something. But whatever the answer, the surgery gave me my life back, gave me more free access to the beauty and the mystery of one of the greatest healing forces of all. And I'm doing my best work now. I won three Grammys this year <laughs> for my last album.
I'm, you know, I'm 60 years old. Who could have predicted that? I did, I got my life back. I was in this terrible, terrible dark tunnel and that tunnel was gonna end in a corner and this team of doctors, they just broke down the wall and they brought me into the light. I feel so lucky. So if I get stressed out or there's a storm coming, you know, I get this headache. <laughs> but it's like normal people might get. And, uh, you know, I still have issues, but people live with a lot worse. I can't do a lot of yoga poses, but I can do a lot. Not all of them, but a lot. I'll never go on another roller coaster or play football again, and that's just fine with me. <laughs> And, and I have so, so much to be grateful for. My family, my doctors, the music, the music just for starters. And I'm also grateful to you um, for taking us zipperheads seriously and for wanting to ease the suffering of so many people like me who are misdiagnosed for so many years. I have a hard head. <laughs> I insist on recovery, and I'm glad to know that there are others like you who are also hard-headed and insist on recovery. So thank you so much for the privilege of telling you my story. Thank you.